A common problem presented in intro level physics is the situation in which you have two blocks connected by a rope on an inclined plane. The first thing we need to do is draw the free body diagram showing the forces acting on each of these blocks. We start with M1 and we look back at the diagram we can see that a rope is attached to M1 and that rope is actually pulling M1 up the ramp and we call that force in which a rope is pulling on an object a tension force, T. So that's why we've labeled T pointing up the incline here. Another force that's acting on M1 is the ramp surface pushing perpendicularly up on M1. This is known as a normal force. And we have indicated that force in our free body diagram as well. Finally, we have the gravitational force Mg pulling down on M1. So we've labeled that force as well. Moving over to M2, we can see that M2 is connected by the very same rope, and since we've already called that force within the rope T, we would also have that same exact force T pulling up on that block M2, so we've shown that force in the free body diagram for M2, and then, of course, we have the gravitational force pulling down on M2, and that will be this force right here, the mass times G. So those would be the two free body diagrams. Next, it's important to understand that the angle that's formed by the incline will be the same as the angle between the gravitational force of M1 and this y-axis that we've drawn in right here. Briefly, the reason for that is as follows. We've redrawn the situation over here. This is the angle of incline of the ramp. The mg force points straight down like this. So because it points straight down, that would form a 90 degree angle right here. This angle right here has to be 90 minus theta, and the reason for that is because the three angles of a triangle have to add to 180. So if you add this angle plus this angle plus 90, you would indeed get 180. You can prove that to yourself real quickly here. The thetas would actually cancel out because you have theta minus theta, and then you would get 90 plus 90 equals 180, which indeed checks. So that angle is 90 minus theta, but the angle that we want is actually this one right here, which is the same as the angle indicated in the free body diagram. That angle is actually just going to be theta. How do we know that? It's because collectively this blue and red angle form a 90 degree angle. So the blue angle, when added to the red angle, should end up equaling 90 degrees. And lo and behold, when we check it, it works because minus theta and plus theta cancel and you get 90 equals 90. So in a nutshell, that's why we know that the angle of the incline will be the same as the angle between the gravitational force and this imaginary y-axis over here. So the next thing we want to do is set up a little force table for each free body diagram. We're going to start with M1. And by force table, what we do is we lay down the forces in our table. So we have three forces, Fn, T, and then M1, G. And then we're going to break them into their X and Y components. Now for X, you are going to use the cosine of an angle. And for Y, you're going to use the sine of an angle. It is very important to understand, though, that when you measure your angles, you measure them from the positive x axis. So for example, the normal force, which points this way, when we measure that angle, it would have a value of 90 degrees. Notice also that when you measure an angle in this direction, in the counterclockwise direction, the angle is positive. The tension force, which points directly along the x axis in our diagram, would actually have an angle of zero degrees because it's pointing already on the axis from which we measure our angles. Finally, this is the important one. We have M1G. We've already said that this angle is theta, which is the angle of incline of the ramp. And the question, I believe, stated that that was 30 degrees. Indeed, it was. But that's not the angle we're going to be using in our force table. We want the angle, again, measured from the positive x-axis. So you want that angle right there when you use that in your force table. To get that angle, you might notice, if you look carefully, that the angle measured from the positive x-axis to that y-axis right there, that's a 270 degree angle. So if you subtract the 270 degrees by the 30 degrees, you would get a 240 degree angle that wraps around from the positive x-axis to our mg force. So in a nutshell, we'll 
say that for x component of mg, you'll have mg times the cosine of the 240 degree angle, and then for the y component, you would have mg times the sine of the 240 degree angle. I think we've gone off the page here, so let me fix that. Let's slide our force table over just a little bit. Okay, now moving on to the normal force, we've said the angle was 90 degrees, so that would be Fn cosine of 90, and this is Fn sine of 90. And then for tension, we said the angle was zero, so it's tension times cos zero, and then tension times the sine of zero. Now, after filling this in, what we like to do is we like to create a resultant column. And in the resultant column, what you basically do is just add your x components, and then you also add your y components. So, for example, the resultant in the x direction would be the sum of our x components, Fn cos of 90 plus tension cos of 0 plus mg cos of 240. So that's your resultant along the x direction. And Newton told us that we take the sum of those forces and we set that equal to the mass times the acceleration in that direction. So in this case, the x direction. Now we actually could do the same thing in the y direction, but it turns out we won't be needing that. And the reason for that is because the block isn't accelerating in our y direction. So for now, we're gonna ignore that. It turns out we won't need that information. Let's clean this equation up just a little bit. We might know that the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So this actually drops out of our equation. We also might know the cosine of zero is one. So this simplifies to T plus M1G cosine of 240 is equal to m1 times the acceleration in the x direction. So this is an equation we're going to want to hang on to. We need another equation, though, in order to solve for the questions being asked. So now we turn over to the other free body diagram, the one for m2. And that was relatively easy, wasn't it? We had upward tension and downward m2g. So we could say, in this case, we don't really need the force table because there aren't any angles to contend with. So for M2, we could say that the sum of the forces in the y direction will equal the mass times the acceleration in the y direction. Again, we only have those two forces, upward tension and the downward mg. So we would have the tension minus m2g. Notice we're saying minus because it's pointing downward equals the mass times the acceleration. Now, it's important to understand that because M2 is accelerating downward, it's basically falling, the acceleration has to be assigned a negative sign to it. Furthermore, the acceleration of block two will be the same as the acceleration of block one. So in fact, we don't need little subscript symbols anymore because those accelerations are going to be equal to one another. So we're gonna take off this little X subscript here. And again, the reason for that is because these accelerations are equal, the blocks are accelerating in tandem. So this is the second equation we need. And now we're going to be able to solve for part A and C, actually all the parts here. Let's go and find the magnitude of the acceleration for each block. We're gonna be doing this by plugging in the known values. So let's return to the first equation. We have tension plus M1. That was the mass of block one, which was 3.7 kilograms. So we'll have 3.7 times G, which is 9.8 times cosine of 240 equals the mass of 3.7 times A. Let's pick up our calculators and multiply 3.7 by 9.8 by cosine of 240, and you would get T minus 18.13 equals 3.7 A. Moving over to block two, we'll plug in known values. T minus the mass of block two, which I believe was 2.3 kilograms, it was, times 9.8, equals the mass, which again is 2.3, times negative A. Don't forget that negative, and it's probably more convenient to stick that negative in front here. So you'll have negative 2.3A. Let's multiply 2.3 by 9.8 so we can simplify this equation. Tension minus 22.54 equals negative 2.3A. To continue solving, why don't we 
add 22.54 to this side of the equation. So now these cancel, we see tension equals the negative 2.3a plus 22.54. You would take that expression for tension and plug it all the way back in to that t right there. So the algebra gets a little bit fun here. So we're gonna have a substitution of negative 2.3a plus 22.54 minus 18.13 equals 3.7a. The good news is we can finally solve for a. Let's combine these like terms. So 22.54 minus 18.13, you have negative 2.3a plus 4.41 equals 3.7a. Go ahead and add 2.3a to both sides. So now you have 4.41 equals 6a, and then finally divide both sides of the equation by 6, and you'll see that the acceleration is 0.735 meters per second squared. So this would be the correct answer to part a of the question. It also wanted to know the direction of the acceleration of the hanging block. Well, we've already concluded that that would be downward, or in the negative y direction if you prefer. So the answer for b is either downward or you could also say negative y direction. Finally, in part c, we need the tension, but that's not gonna be difficult. We have this equation right up here that we can use to solve for tension. So we say tension equals negative 2.3 times the acceleration that we just found, plus 22.54. And when you work this out, you're going to find the tension is about 20.8 newtons. So this would be the correct answer to part C.